Without further ado, I want to go ahead and introduce our authors for this evening. Uh, Alexander Hemmen is the author of the novels The Lazarus Project and Nowhere Man, both of which were nominated for National Book Critics Circle Awards, as well as the novel The Making of Zombie Wars and the short story collections The Question of Bruno, Love and Other Obstacles, and the nonfiction book The Book of My Lives. His most recent book is a double memoir, My Parents, An Introduction, and This Does Not Belong to You. He's written journalism, screenplays, and for the Netflix series Sense8, and for the upcoming Matrix film, if I'm correct. And he's currently a professor of creative writing at Princeton University. Please welcome Alexander Hemmen. And additionally, uh, we have Eula Biss, who is the author of four books, including On Immunity, which was named one of the 10 best books of 2014 by the New York Times Book Review and Notes from No Man's Land, which won the National Book Critics Circle Award for Criticism in 2009. Her essays and prose poems have recently appeared in The Guardian, The New York Review of Books, The Believer, Freeman's, Jubilate, The Baffler, Harper's, and The New York Times Magazine. She teaches nonfiction writing at Northwestern University. Her latest book, Having and Being Had, is the reason we're here this evening. So please join me in welcoming you to this. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> Um, huge thanks to Green Apple Books for, for hosting this, this launch, and, um, and huge thanks to the great Alexandra Hammond for being here in conversation. I do want to say his most recent book, Two Books in One, is really extraordinary. I really love it. Um, so we'll get to that eventually. Um, and here's, here's my new book, Having and Being Had. Um, this book is written in a, a series of, of nearly a hundred short titled works. Um, and I'm going to read just a couple of them tonight. Uh, each one looks a little something like this, just a couple pages long. And, um, and it covers themes of work, money, class, capitalism. I'm going to start with a piece titled commercial. Our house is a brick bungalow, nearly identical to the house next door. These houses were built by brothers, both dead now. I learned this from my neighbor who lives in the other brother's house. He's a retired postal worker and a saxophone player who still practices every day, though his health is too poor now for him to perform. The interiors of our houses are the same, he tells me, except for my attic which the former owners of our house renovated. He would like to renovate his attic too, but he doesn't have the money. Some relatives of his are in prison and all his extra money goes to supporting their families. I guess God, he says, doesn't want me to have money. I'm not sure, but I think he's joking about God. He's told me already about attending the same elementary school my son attends and of being beaten on the playground. He's told me that he couldn't, in those days, risk a conversation with a woman like me. He had to keep his head down when he passed a white woman on the sidewalk, he said, and just respond, yes, ma'am, if she spoke to him. He's told me also of refusing a holiday turkey offered to him by the owner of a mansion by the lake, a rich man who demanded that he wade through deep snow to deliver packages to the service entrance at the back of the house. The former owners of our house, who were white, made extra money by allowing the house to be used as a set for commercials. John discovers this when he gets a call from a casting agent who wants to know if the house is available. It's not available. We live here. But then we learn how much we will be paid. All we have to do is leave the house for three days and two nights, and we'll, we'll earn $8,000. The commercial is going to be for Walmart the corporation that produced the fortunes of four of the 20 richest people in this country. Walmart couldn't build stores in Chicago for years, but they're here now, despite ongoing protests over low wages, and they want their commercial set in a classic Chicago bungalow. We don't own anything from Walmart, but this doesn't matter because Walmart furniture is moved into the house, Walmart curtains are put up, and some Walmart prints are hung on the walls in Walmart frames. A white set designer and a white director work to create an authentic African-American interior. The commercial, they tell us, is going to feature an African-American grandmother serving a holiday turkey. 
Next door in the house, just like ours, lives an actual African-American grandmother, the wife of the retired postal worker. We're getting paid to have our house made over to look like what a set designer imagines their house looks like so that Walmart can try to sell things to people like who look like them. John tells all this to his friend, Dan, who says, I think that's the definition of white privilege. The right white. I'm taking possession of the house by painting it, every room. And the question of what color in what room is consuming me. I think maybe I should start with historical colors, but I can see the original color of the walls under the layers of chip paint, cloying pink. Maybe memory, not history, is the place to start. Buttered yam from my mother's garden, evening blue, an old bottle half buried in the dirt, forest moss, the color of my mother's little living room, which smelled like wood smoke. Colored theory, a work in which artist Amanda Williams painted houses slated for demolition on the south side of Chicago, began as a collection of colors. Harold's chicken shack red, brown, crown royal purple, pink oil, ultra sheen blue, flame and hot orange, currency exchange yellow. This palette, she says, combined my Ivy League training as an architect with my lived sensibility as a South Side native. Each house was painted a single color from the bricks of the foundation to the shingles on the roof. She painted only houses that weren't worth anything to anyone, not to dealers, not to squatters, not to neighborhood teenagers. Zero value was her term. And she painted these zero value properties in colors drawn from products sold to black people. Every color, she says, is a code. I'm having trouble finding the right white. I don't like opulence white or Chantilly lace or French manicure. This conversation is boring, my sister complains. Maybe I'll give up on white, I tell her, and paint the living room peach. Peach is problematic, she says, laughing at me. I've discovered a brand of paint that I can't afford, but I could buy it. To afford something like paint for someone of my class is to announce your values most often, not your financial capacity. I can't admit to valuing paint that costs $110 per gallon, but I find this paint unbearably luminous and undeniably better than any other paint. At night, when my family's asleep, I study paint swatches from the hardware store, and then I open the heavy folds of the catalog from Faro and Ball and run my fingers over the small squares of paint, slightly raised in a state emulsion. Even the names are better. Matchstick, string, cord, skimming stone. These are not aspirational whites. These whites can afford to be modest. One is even called blackened. I remember the great revelation of moving up from acrylic paints in high school to oil paints in college. First, just black and white on paper, and then a full set on canvas. They were worth the expense, those silken oils and their slim metal tubes. I loved all the colors, especially the cadmium orange, which was slightly toxic, flame and hot. This is the closest I've come to painting in years, shopping for paint. I send a swatch of sulking room pink to Robin, knowing she'll appreciate the name. To sulk in French is Boudé, the source of boudoir, a woman's private room, a room of one's own in a dusty, moneyed pink. And then there's etiquette, a white described as a well-mannered hue. It's a white that's hiding behind its own whiteness. Another line for this white poem. My mind is on paint now more often than poetry. I've found a new literature, crisp linen, collector's item, white zippendel, Pashmina, Fine China, Ivory Tower, Mirage White, American White. Benjamin Moore has declared simply white the color of the year. This in the year a white man will be elected to the White House. The selection of white as the color of the year was, quote, inevitable, the creative director of Benjamin Moore explains. The color white is transcendent, she says, powerful and polarizing. It's either taken for granted or obsessed over. I obsess, which solves nothing. Deep in thought is my favorite name for white, but I don't really like the color. I wouldn't want my walls deep in thought. 
On my way to a parent-teacher conference, I stop in the hallway of the elementary school to photograph a huge box of institutional toilet paper, the color listed on the label as empathy white. Maybe that's the color I'm looking for, or a variant, a concerned off-white like all apologies, or something more revealing like paperwork white or payroll white, or maybe I should just paint it all property. All right, so that's the, that's the taste. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Yula. Um, first of all, I'm so happy to be able to see you and talk to you and to celebrate your new book. Thank um, you. I, I, it is great. Um, I read it and reread it. And it is part of your um, ongoing um, investigation of the way we live in this country uh, from the kind of grassroots investigation. Um, full disclosure, you and I have been friends for a while from the time I lived in Chicago. And so a lot of people mentioned the book, I know who they are, they do exist. <laughs> um, but also I remember when you, you started working on this book and worked on it. And I remember um, a particular kind of investment that I sensed in you, that is your driving um, force was not knowing. Mm -hmm. He wanted to figure things out. Yeah. This is this is the opposite of men's planning, right? <laughs> it is the insecurity of one's knowledge, the curiosity that drove your investigation. And then what is great about the book is that we follow you as you think through each of those situations. Um, but when you were talking about it, I remember you saying that you wanted to understand capitalism, right? Mm -hmm. And the book is both, all, everything in it is about capitalism and then also it is not. So at this time, could you just tell us, tell me um, about the genesis of the book, the evolution, where it started, how it happened, and how did you reach uh, this forum? Yeah, yeah. Um, thanks for that insight on, on the, the work being driven by not knowing. I, I do really feel like that's the, that's the engine behind all of my writing is I guess first becoming aware that there's something I don't know or understand and then being driven to try to learn more and know more. Um, the, book, the book actually began, I think it began with my last book on immunity. Um, there was just one brief little chapter in on immunity where um, I touched briefly on um, one of the reasons why people are reluctant to vaccinate or one of the stances uh, of people who don't vaccinate, which is, as I understand it, an anti-capitalist stance, this idea that um, people feel suspicious of uh, vaccines because they're products of big pharmaceutical companies in um, being distributed by the government of a country that doesn't provide very good consumer protections or oversight for many um, other consumer goods. but. It happens to be not true of vaccines. They're the one thing that is as tightly regulated as all our goods should be. But um, but I understood this the stance um, as one of being a, a stance produced by the suspicion and um, and kind of fear of other people's motives that capitalism I think encourages and, and generates. But. I, that was a very brief chapter, just a few pages long, um, but I had this sense that there was so much there, especially around our own psychological experience of our, and kind of daily lived experience of our economic system. It made me wonder, what is this system doing to our relationships? What is it doing to our ability to trust other people? What is it doing to our everyday lives, the, the very like texture of our lives? Um, and so I think that this project partly came from that bit of curiosity that got churned up writing about that, the emotional state of, of parents who couldn't trust um, vaccines because of what they know about the nature of the system. Um, and, but I didn't, I didn't have the, the interest or really the ability to investigate our economic system in any abstract way. So it was really important to me to, um, to look at it through the concrete, through the, the materials of a lived life. So that's why this book is told through 
my house, my conversations with my neighbors, my conversations at bars with other writers like you, um, my, uh, sometimes my things, my dresser from Ikea, um, a necklace that I buy at one point, um, a Donna Summers song. <laughs> um, I, I really wanted, I, I guess I needed to lash the thinking in this book to the, the, the physical world and, and the lived experience of our economy. So I, I think the other thing that really drove me in this book is, was the realization, this, this happened as I was writing, I had, was having a phone conversation with a friend and um, this friend admitted to me with kind of like um, chagrin and embarrassment that he didn't really know what capitalism was. And I thought, oh, I'll fix that problem. I'll explain it to you right now. And I got like half a sentence in before I realized that I didn't know what capitalism was. I didn't really know anything about it. I didn't know where it began, when, um, anything about its dimensions. And so there's this other thread running through the book, which is me trying to find, trying to answer this question of what do I mean when I say the word capitalism? I, I was kind of horrified that I'd been walking around saying capitalism for my entire adult life and, and had been using this word I, I clearly didn't really understand. Um, and so there are many moments throughout the book where I ask someone what's capitalism and, um, or go to a book looking for an answer to that question and various different possibilities um, emerge in the book, but it's, it's not a question that is easily answered is, is part of what the book revealed to me. Um, I felt actually significantly less stupid about capitalism after um, <laughs> after realizing that it's it's even a difficult question for some economists to answer. Um, I feel significantly less stupid after reading your book twice. <laughs> reading it. When I when I said not knowing, what I meant is um, one of the aspects of capitalism is the culture of expertise, right? Mm -hmm. But the expertise is often positional, which is why men are often experts. People from positions of power um, pretend they know what they're talking about. Right? All the, you know, much of the, uh, the uh, New York Times columnist cadre is, is doing that. They really don't know anything. They just talk as they do. Um, and so there's a, an upside to expertise, obviously, as in, you know, in medicine, people who talk about vaccines they do know what they talk about at least they should right mm -hmm. um but what i find fascinating in your work in the book in particular is that to write um literature from the position of curiosity from the position of not taking things for granted that is of non-expertise the opposite of expertise allows for um what you do and i love that in any kind of writing and in yours in particular is to to watch the writer think in writing Right, so no conclusion is reached before the moment of writing. We are present in your thinking. In, in films, directors like actors who um, you can watch think. I think in literature, I want to, to see the writer think and think actively, not from the top, but from the everyday practices of capitalism. And that to me is, uh, it requires enormous discipline and patience. Right. This is one of the things I admire about you as a person is that the patience, I would have either declared that I know what capitalism is, capitalism is very early and then do my, you know, mansplaining stuff, or I would have just given up. I don't know. I'm going to, I'm going to move into the area where I do know stuff. Um, and I want to ask you about um, the sense of instability, if that's what it is, or sort of how long can curiosity drive you before you start feeling despair? That is, I can't figure this out. Yeah. And how does writing, the very act of writing, of producing text as, a, as an act of communication, how does that rectify this sense, if that's the sense of being at sea? Yeah, yeah. That's such a great question. It's so sensitive to the process. It's, um, and I, th I think that the thing that's uncomfortable about writing for me is that I have to get right, right up to the edge of total despair over my own lack of understanding or knowledge. And, and 
the interesting thing to me is I, I have one of the uses of research is to show me how much I don't know. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, it was partly beginning to, to read about the history of capitalism and about economics in general that um, brought me to an awareness of how much there was to know and how much I didn't know. And even if all I was curious about was the emergence of contemporary capitalism, that's like a 400 year history. So that alone is just a, a, a colossal body of knowledge. And so, um, and I felt this way writing about vaccination too. I, you know, when I, I sat down at some point with no science background and I sat down with an immunologist and asked him if he could just explain the immune system to me. <laughs> he kind of politely let me know that that was a really big ask. And, um, and he said, you, you'd be better off investigating anything else, like brain science, anything else. This is the most complex system in the entire body. Um, and as much as that felt incredibly daunting to me, I, I think there's also a kind of excitement that gets kicked up for me around that. Like, okay, great. We're in the most complicated territory we can be in. Um, and so I do think it's, a, it's a, a balance that is sometimes very uncomfortable for me to, to uh, feel like I'm edging a little bit too close to the despair part. And with both of these last two books I've written, I, I finished the book still feeling like, oh, there's so much more to know. There's so much more to investigate um, and kind of, um, but feeling like I had exhausted the energy in my own questions. I guess that's the thing that was was driving the book. Um, but you know, there's, it's also seductive to me. The the I think it's something that I'm constantly trying to protect myself against and and um, deny myself is the seductiveness of the the position of expert. Um, it's, I would like to, part of me would like to have that and would like to occupy that position and, um, and would like to wield that kind of authority. I think especially as a woman, I'd like to swing that sword around a little bit. Um, but I, I also know it's incredibly dangerous to the kind of writing that I do and that I have to resist the temptation to, um, to act like an ex expert or, or to pretend expertise, that it, it really is like I have to embrace the not knowing. Um, I remember a great joke you told about this though. It's, it didn't make it into the book, but I was, I was so excited because I was uh, in, a, in a bar in Chicago with you and, um, and I met uh, a wonderful Bosnian economist who teaches at University of Chicago and um, and I asked him what capitalism is. And um, after asking me if I was serious with that question, he, he <laughs> launched into a few different answers. Um, and uh, he, he had layers of answers for that question. And um, I was tremendously excited because he was the first person I'd talked to who, who had um, what felt to me like a really coherent answer for that question. And I said to you excitedly, I, 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 I found some answers to my question. And you said, well, if you've got a question, a Bosnian has an answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nation of experts, yes. <laughs> yes it's, it's in the constitution yeah, to be an expert, to be a Bosnian. <laughs> um, well, yeah, no, I'm proud. Um, because one of the things that I find um, interesting, but also a courageous and, and provocative in the best sense is that you do not shy away from money and talking about money. And there's a, I can't remember when you told me that you would um, stay the amount of money involved in the transactions, in the situations, in the book, right? And it's uh, one of the things that I learned here upon my moving here almost 30 years ago is that the, the cultural trope that one never talks about money and politics right at thanksgiving dinner or any other place right and so it's very hard to talk about not to talk about politics at this time in particular but talking about money still kind of makes a lot of people uncomfortable and, um, and awkward and um can you talk a bit about that why yeah. you decided to save the amounts the price of the house the salary the yeah. Um, 
the Guggenheim Fellowship and so on. Oh, definitely. But I'm curious, was that different in Bosnia? Were, were people more open about money? They were, but it was not much money to be open about. Yeah. So it's, yeah. uh, I, I think part of it, well, I left at the cusp of capitalism and war, um, a rival of capitalism, because I grew up in socialism. So mm -hmm. the um, social differences, that is the, the income gap, were incredibly narrow compared to this, right? You know, mm -hmm. People who had two apartments were considered to be rich, mm -hmm. right? Two, the, two people who own privately two apartments, as oh, opposed yeah, to right. living in an apartment <laughs> that was given to you by the state, right? They mm -hmm. were thought of as rich, as being incredibly privileged, and would be criticized in the newspapers, mm -hmm. and people would hate them, right? The functionaries of the Communist Party. The mm -hmm. income gap here is still inconceivable to me. So mm -hmm. there was not much to talk about. And also people, it's a different concept um, of intimacy and closeness, right? Mm -hmm. And so people would, people were nosier than they are here all across the board. So money was not such a uh, taboo topic. No. Yeah, that's so interesting to me. And I, I do wonder if it's partly the, the our, our shame over the vast inequality in this country that is is behind this taboo against talking about money, especially if you have it, right? It's, um, I think that people that don't have very much money are much more open about their finances and what they have um, than people on the upper end of the spectrum. And um, yeah, it's interesting, you know, um, I was surprised by how excruciating it was to uh, put those, the numbers on the page, um, things like my salary, what, my father paid for my college tuition, um, what I paid for my house, um, even little things, what I paid for a necklace. Um, it's, uh, I, I was surprised partly because I'd already done a, a lot of writing about intimate and private subjects, uh, writing about um, my love affairs, writing about my my child's birth, writing about my own body, writing about um, my race, writing about whiteness. I, I thought that I'd already been in really uncomfortable terrain. I, like, I thought that I'd been in the most uncomfortable terrain I could be in. And um, I, was, I was shocked by how uncomfortable I was just putting a number on the page and how exposed it made me feel. And um, when I noticed how exposed it made me feel, that made me even more dedicated to the project of bringing the numbers to the page. I, I felt like, okay, if it makes me this uncomfortable, it must be important to do. Um, and it gave me an opportunity to think about the discomfort and to think about what, what, felt, so, um, what felt so exposing about those numbers. What did I think that... Um, I was giving away or, um, or showing about myself. Um, what did I want to hide and why? It, it opened all these questions for me, questions that really helped drive me through the work and made, made the work, I think, richer and more interesting um, because I was, I was squirming a little bit, um, not even, you know, not even under the idea of scrutiny from the outside sometimes. Sometimes I was just squirming in front of myself. I was like <laughs> um, embarrassed alone with myself. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and that, uh, that was such a strange sensation to be writing from. And um, yeah, so that I, I do think that that propelled me into interesting questions, but it, of everything in the book, it was the most uncomfortable for me to do. That was the, the hardest decision to make on the page, strangely. Um, well, it, it does make a lot of sense. We were talking about um, money in Bosnia or some other places, but one of the things that's related to that is that in, in former Yugoslavia, in fact, it, it's not so much cultural as it uh, political, that it, at, time of, at the time of socialism, right? Um, there was private property was allowed to, to a certain extent. And in, in the language, in Bosnian language and the similar languages, there's no word for privacy. The concept mm -hmm. is there present, but there's no specific word where right? you have to a, a, approach it descriptively, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the word private is used for property, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. And so in, in English, you can see the connection, right? The private property yeah. and privacy yes. are 
closely related. Right? Yes. So privacy implies protecting your property from um, outside gaze, from yeah. pro protecting your property from someone other than you evaluating it, right? Yeah. To own your property fully, you have to own the amount of money that you gave to it, the information about the, the amount of money that you gave for that property. Otherwise, it's not private, right? It's not right. entirely yours. Yeah. So, um, I'm sorry, it's, it's, it's a... No, that's so interesting. What do you think about that, yeah? Yeah, I, it, it's fascinating to me, it, partly because when I started looking into this history of early capitalism, kind of emerging in, in England in circa 1600, but before too. Um, it's really the history of boundaries and borders. It's, it's a history that is, you know, can be told and understood through things like hedges and fences and uh, all the various physical mechanisms that people used for um, keeping other people and animals off land that had been understood up until that point as something that yeah could be owned by someone but that anyone one could range onto so it's this the concept of property being private in the sense we use it today was wasn't there yet it's um it, there were these long-standing rights for um common people to use land that didn't belong to them in certain ways and and those ways were very delineated you know you could use um you could go into forests and gather wood that had fallen for a fire. Um, and these were subsistence rights. They were, they were the right to, um, they were the right for poor people to live, basically is what these rights were. And, um, and that's part of what got dismantled uh, by this, the emergence of the concept of private property. But there were all these actual physical barriers put up to keep people out of the spaces that were now defined as private. And, and I do feel like we have a, a, an inheritance from that. It's um, uh, it, a psychological inheritance from that that is around um, borders and boundaries and, um, and psychological walls. One of the things that is um, fascinating about, about the book is that um, or one of the um, themes that you address is the, the way that women, particularly women artists, operate in capitalism, in this particular set of economic and then private relations. So you write about Virginia Woolf and her servant, uh, Emily Dickinson, um, Alice B. Toklas and Gertrude Stein, and a number of others. Um, and it does obviously make perfect sense, but could you talk a little more about what you have learned or what you found interesting about the position of women in, in capitalism, um, yeah. in the history of capitalism? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, to put it briefly, women got so screwed um, in the emergence of capitalism, um, partly in that most of the work that women were doing and did and still do got defined out of our our concept of employment. So this work pre-capitalism was recognized as real work with a real economic value. So caring for children, making food, um, gardening, um, all, all these everyday tasks that were often in the, the women's sphere um, during, I guess, medieval era, um, those were understood as real work. Um, and so uh, long outside that moment of transition, I, I, I really feel those pressures in my own life. Uh, and, and I didn't feel them as acutely before I had a child, but as soon as I had a child, I, um, I felt acutely the problem of doing two kinds of labor that were either totally uncompensated or undercompensated. So um, before I'd had a balance in my life where essentially my work as a teacher subsidized my work as an artist. And, um, and then I, I moved into this moment after I had a child where I was doing the uncompensated work of parenting and the less compensated, lower compensated work of writing and trying to balance that against the time it took to do paid employment and the equation didn't seem to be working out for me. There just didn't seem to be enough time. Um, 
And I think that that's part of what drew me back to some of these figures. Um, most of the figures actually that I gravitated to didn't have children. So Virginia Woolf, Emily Dickinson, um, and they were able to write in their time periods. They were able to do what they did in, in part because they didn't have children. And that that's one of the things that I realized um, when I, I went back as someone with a child to look at these um, these other white women, upper middle class white women from history um, who in some ways I was playing with them as avatars for myself. I was, I was thinking through them, especially Virginia Woolf. She'd been important to me early on in college. And, um, and I, I did take A Room of One's Own as, as life advice. I read it as a kind of map for how to, how to live and work as a woman writer. And, um, and then I, I went back in writing this book, um, I went back and read about her relationship to money and her relationship with her servants. And um, that was, it was pretty difficult. It's, uh, it's, it's not a pretty portrait. It's not, um, it's, she had a really fraught relationship with the women who made it possible for her to live her life as an artist. Um, and I think that part of that is from the, the story she had to tell herself in order to live with, um, with other women. Sometimes it was just one other woman who was doing all her domestic chores. The story she had to tell herself was, well, that woman is much stupider than I am. And that woman is incapable of writing poetry or, or literature. Um, there's some point where she says the lower classes don't produce literature. That's just her, her statement. Even though at one point her sister fired a, a governess and they found um, the governess left behind a draft of a novel. Um, and the novel was all about how terrible it was to work for Vanessa Bell. <laughs> and, um, and it was according to the, the correspondence between Virginia and her sister, it was really devastating, but unfortunately it's lost to history. We, we could really use that novel, I think. Um, but they were, um, they were surprisingly scandalized um, by how uh, resentful this, this woman was who had been working for them. Um, I, their, their stance was she ought to feel lucky. Um, and uh, so I, I found in this, you know, in these, I guess, class relationships between women of another era, I, I saw echoes of our, our own system and our own moment. And I, I think it, it actually helped clarify some of my own relationships for me because um, I don't have servants who live in my home and that's no longer typical for the middle class. So it was typical for the middle class in, in Virginia Woolf's time. Um, but I still have servant relationships, you know, and I think that's the, the thing our economy hides is these relationships with the people who do our, um, our dirty work. And, um, and there's, when I put a, a, a lot of thought into it, I know there's, this, I'm especially aware of this now because of, of this is now unavailable to me. Um, all the women, the underpaid women who supply childcare for me, and um, you know, ever since the pandemic started, that is gone. That um, that you know, what I thought of as an absolute necessity to my writing life, um, but that now feels like a luxury. You know, having. Um, someone else doing the work of, of child care and educating a child and all the other things that go into supporting a child's life. Um, these are most often done by these low wage workers who sometimes don't have basic security like health insurance and paid vacation and things like this. Um, so it's, I, w I went through a moment of feeling horrified by Virginia Woolf, just disgusted, and then a moment of thinking, I'm not sure I'm all that different than her, actually. So that's, that's part of what was going, going on there. I think I was, I was looking at these women in, in order to kind of look at myself uh, through one eye. And um, I, I think it made me, it easier for me to see some things that were hard to look at. 
um, what you're talking about and what, what you were talking about just now, but also um, in relation to the women artists you mentioned, is that the conditions of producing art in a particular system, in a particular set of social and economic uh, conditions and um, relations. And so you do, the, the, uh, you bring it up in the, in the book brilliantly over and over again, the, how to value art in capitalism, because mm -hmm. capitalism is a system of value exchange. And so art in that system is measured by that value, which is monetary, right, or market value. Yeah. And so uh, what we do, I would think, um, I don't think of how much money I'm going to make if I write a thousand words today, which are all awful, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, but I also know that once I'm done, it'll become an object, a, a thing that I might be able to sell for some money, right? Yeah. And so the uh, monetary valuation of art and the way that art operates in capitalism, do you deal with that over and over again from a personal point of view? And yeah. from personal experience. Could you talk a little about that? Yeah, yeah. The, the idea of ser art as service also comes up? Yeah, yeah. I was really uh, going back and forth around my, my feelings and my ideas around what capitalism does to or for art and the artist. Um, the, there's obvious disadvantages to being an artist under a system that doesn't really value art and to not be able to, um, you know, for most artists, most artists can't support themselves, can't pay their rent on their art. Um, those of us who do are extremely lucky and, um, but for vast majority of artists can't do that. Um, and it's easy to see the disadvantages there, but one of the things that I was thinking about and, and playing with a little bit is the possibility that, um, that there is real value to that, to being um, cut off from the usual system of compensation. And um, in some ways it's very clarifying. It's, uh, if, you're going to be, if you're going to be spending your time making art, you have to be, um, you have to be doing it because you want to. It's, if there's, if for, for, you know, for most people or for at least for the early parts of most people's careers, there's no other reason to do it other than that you want to or you need to, which is probably more accurate for many artists is that there's, there's an action, there's a drive or a need to do it. Um, and so I started, you know, playing with the possibility that this is what art has to offer us art makers, but also what it has to offer society as a whole. It's this, this a kind of alternative, a, a, a window into an alternative value system in which a work is done not for profit, but for other reasons. Um, and that doesn't mean that people never profit off their art, but that profit can't usually be the, the sole motivation. Um, I don't know, but I, I'm curious, what are your thoughts about this as someone who's, you know, variously er earned your money in various ways and but but been a very serious artist for for quite a while now? What, how do you feel about your, your place? I, I, <laughs> well, I mean, I, we were talking about it earlier. I, during the pandemic, I started um, making music as an amateur, a total dilettante, in fact perhaps an idiot in the, you know, the original Greek sense, because I didn't really know how to do that. But something happened, and there are other conditions that allowed for this to happen, including my wife taking the, um, the weight of childcare mainly. Um, but the, the liberating thing about making music, because there's no hope of career in music, right? There's no money in it. There's no, there's no expectation. No one, if I didn't tell you, you would know, then why would you know? And so suddenly I can play. Uh, and the, the idea of play, that I mean, investigation, you know, uh, in the sense, I'm going to go over there and see, see what is over there. Mm -hmm. It is to a totally opposite position from expertise. Mm -hmm. And we as professional writers who, you know, speak to an audience, we, by necessity, whatever we might feel, we present ourselves as experts. I'm an expert in writing. I teach writing at Princeton, right? And whereas my daily practice of writing, I get up in the morning and I have face a page of problems that I created for myself. Now, what do I do? And because I've done it before, I go through it because that's what I like doing, right? Not because of money. I like doing this. I like solving these problems. Mm -hmm. But at the end of this path, the professional path, I will make a thing that might 
make profit. And then I will be both tormented by the fact that it will be evaluated monetarily and also that it will be undervaluated to my <laughs> mind. Because I, so, I, you know, not, not because I want more money, because I've spent so much thinking in this. And then there'll be some, you know, half s review by a confused reviewer and then it'll, you know, it'll be middling sales. And then I'll, uh, the part of me will think maybe it's not that good because it matches this number, right? In some um, abstract system of value, right? And mm -hmm. so there's, it is impossible to live that way because you have to, I have to feed children too. Um, mm -hmm. But ideally I would make art just because I like doing it. And then I would give it to people I like and then some strangers who I, you know, to see if we can talk about these things and they will give me something in return. But mm -hmm. that is, that is not going to happen. This is, and this is what your book is about. Yeah. You cannot live in a non-capitalist way in capitalism. Yeah, yeah. It's also what Marx's books are about, uh, but that's a, a different, different yeah. style. I think I think we better write it. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to believe it's slightly more readable than Marx. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, this is, I, I think this is something that I also did during the period I was writing this book, I started taking piano lessons and I have zero musical background or inclination. And I'm, I'm not even where you're at, where you can, you can, feasibly play um, and, and create something. Um, you know, I was just learning the scales and, um, and you know, pounding out the occasional like Frere Jaca or one of uh, uh, nursery rhymes on the piano. Um, but it, it was a process that was so full of delight for me for the same reason that it was um, unhinged from, from any sort of expectations or work or um, possibility even of performance, you know, it's, there is nothing performative was going to happen. It was really about my relationship to the sound that this instrument was making. And it felt very beautiful to me. And it, it, I think it was also a return to what writing felt like before um, I began to try to make a living off of it. And, um, and I tried to work some of that spirit into this book. I tried to work um, play into this book, not in the sense of music, but in terms of having fun and making jokes. And um, uh, my original idea was that this book, my like subversion of capitalism was that I would write a book that was only fun from beginning to end. Um, and it didn't work out that fun. way. <laughs> It is fun. It is, it is compulsively readable. I mean, I reread it again for this uh, conversation. It is, it is so easy and fun to read. It's so um, intelligent in every sentence, but it's never because you, we, we want you, I, we read you as you think, mm -hmm. right? The process of thinking is on the page and the thoughts that come out of this process are extremely interesting I mean, in, in life. And this, it, it, that's, I think that's the sense of play. We can see you play banging the keyboard and then something happens, right? Yeah. It's the process of learning. I mean, I don't, I don't mean to sound like, you know, that uh, too privileged and I just decide to play music um, and then I do it because I can't while people have to work for a living. It is the living that is the compulsion to make thing, things is at the source of art, right? Mm -hmm. Not to sell things, but to make things. Mm -hmm. And then if once I have a thing made, then what do I do with it? I would like to make more things and I need food for that. So I'd like to sell the thing so I can finance making the next thing. But then you enter this, you know, system of, of value and then something feels not lost, but rather it, it is a different kind of negotiation happens. And there's, then there's a value in not knowing. Yeah. If I actually knew how to make music, I'd probably lose interest. If I knew how to write, I would stop writing. How to write the next book. I'm an expert on my previous book, but the next book I'm totally lost. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a, there's a great, great quote from John McPhee, the last book doesn't teach you how to write the next book. It's yeah, that which I find you know so nothing. true. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I don't know if it's time for Q&A. Uh, we, I can talk more to you uh, until the cows come home, as they say, but uh, Car, wh what do you say? This is a great conversation. I could also listen to you two talk for a very long time, but I do want to, we're getting close to the end of the hour, so I want to open it up uh, for audience questions and 
We do have one. I would encourage uh, everyone joining us to please, if you do have questions, type them in here and we'll get to them. This first one uh, is from Jeff, loved the book. Uh, and he asks, how do you decide what to write about and when you're actually officially writing one thing? How do you decide when what you're presumably reflecting on over time will be your next book, book constitute your next book? And I'll, I'll add this too that he says, is it fairly intentional from near the beginning or is it more like space gases ultimately ultimately accreting into some kind of planet or sun? <laughs> Ooh, I like the space gases. It's <laughs> totally like space gases. Um, I think for me, and this is probably just my own psychology, um, but I'd be interested to see whether this is true for Sasha as well. I have to back myself into a major project. If I tell myself in the beginning that I'm I'm writing a book, I run the risk of kind of freezing up and 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 also watching myself too much. I, I think it's partly actually to preserve that sense of play. Is um, so almost all of my books have started. Uh, I've done a significant amount of work before I know it's a book or even intend it to be a book. Um, so with this particular book that is written in these short titled pieces. I was writing little short titled pieces for quite a while. Um, and, you know, first I, I was just doing it to see where each little piece would go. And then I started to kind of have a lot of them. And eventually I showed them all to a friend, um, Sarah Levine, terrific writer, who said, oh, I think, I think this is, wants to be a book. Um, and that's, it, it's, for me, it's often someone else who suggests to me that the material has that potential. And I think I, um, I might scare myself if I told myself that. Um, and so once, once I find myself with enough material and enough kind of, enough questions really to drive into the work, then I start being able to admit that maybe what I'm doing is more ambitious than just a little playing around. Um, but what about you, Alexander? Um, well, I, what you described now is the, how I wrote one of the two books that you sh showed. Um, this does not belong to you. Um, I started writing fragments and then they aggregated and, and I decided not to even consider it being a book until I had a hundred and then I would look at it and then then I wrote a hundred and then I thought that this could be a book. But the other book, however, I did write, I had it planned and I had it, I had it under contract and I knew what I wanted to do and I had um, ideas and I wrote um, many of those pieces before. Not for, I mean, I wrote them individually and published them in various magazines and journals and then they were in the book. Part of it is that I um, I spend time being a journalist and I do like deadlines and word limits and the pressure of mm -hmm. that, right? And so I could, um, that stimulates me too. But I also love the, um, to do it your way or, or my way too. Mm -hmm. That is to keep it open, this sort of full mm -hmm. investigation. I'm going to follow this trail wherever it takes me. And, and the possibility of failure is, is fully present in the project. And that strangely has a kind of liberating um, effect, mm -hmm. right? That, that I don't have to succeed. I'm just going to see what happens. Yeah, yeah. Right? And so it, it undermines the expertise position. So one of those books I wrote like an expert on my hands, and the other one I wrote like, a, like as I did when I was, you know, when I started writing. I'm going to write a text, and then I'm going to write another text, and then it becomes a book. Where did those little pieces come from originally? Did it just kind of, it bubbled up for you? Uh, they were always part of, in my mind. And then I, they, I, I, I was, I respond to obsessions mm. as a writer, whatever the methodology is, yeah. I trust my obsession. The mm. things that I think about compulsively and obsessively for years. Mm. And then I write them. Mm. And then they could be differently organized under different conditions. But I do trust my obsessions. Obsessions in the sense of, you know, asking the same questions and sometimes just repeating the same words or having an obsessive memory. Um, there, were, there were no involuntary memories in that book. They're all obsessive memories in various ways. Mm -hmm. 
I love that. Um, I also respect writers as pattern seekers. I think both of you do that very well. Mm -hmm. um, this question comes from Aaron, and this is a good question for the both of you as well. I'm wondering if you could talk more about the, quote, psychological inheritance of ideas around privacy. What do you think are the implications of this psychological inheritance? <laughs> go for it. If you have an answer, go for it. <laughs> yeah, we are, I'm a Bosnian, so I do have an answer. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, I'm sure you have a lot to say about this, but one thing about privacy, and it particularly um, it is connected to private property, is, is it's indistinguishable from the sense that someone is watching and judging. Um, I, I, my first um, wife, she was so concerned that her privacy would be violated, that someone would be watching through our windows, that at some point, inside to see what we were doing. I was doing nothing, watching television. Uh, that I thought, you might have a Puritan. You probably have a Puritan somewhere in your family line. And she looked into it and there was a Puritan, right? Because it is a fundamentally Puritan, uh, moralistic um, thing. And in terms of Protestant work ethic, it ties into that too, right? It's that too, you are judged um, by someone who's always watching you. Um, your moral value is judged by this observer, right? By others in the community, other Puritans, but also they represent this ultimate moral authority. But your moral value is also measured by your property, right? And so to a, a, a properly moral person has, is re, um, rewarded with property, which you also have to protect. So protecting privacy as a, as a private domain of one's human agency, right? Unrelated to out things outside is really has to take place within a defined um, private domain i mean in terms of property spatial domain inside a house inside a um a courtyard inside a property inside a you know um a, a, a territory and so it is a form of control too right to have a sense that you're constantly being watched and this is before all the surveillance i think there are systems technological systems of surveillance they come out of it, right? With the, 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 our need to, to various degrees, depending where we come from, where we grew up, to, uh, to be validated in the society by those who are watching us and we don't even know who they are, right? Because if we are properly validated, we get to have property. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so interesting. Uh, it's, I also asked myself, you know, around the, the issue of privacy around money, I asked myself, who does it serve for this information to remain private? Um, and it occurred to me that the people who are best served by us being silent about or quiet about what we have or, or considering our own finances private are the people who have the most. And that it's, um, that, that that privacy is really in service to hiding the degree of inequality we're living with this as well as um people's complicity in in the system of inequality and so once i put some thought into that that also it helped me break that privacy barrier it, i felt like the privacy was in the interest of the the owning class yeah well. I think it is in a country like this, where it is constantly skirting the possibility of vast social conflict because of inequality, right? Mm -hmm. and to, it is necessary not to talk about money too much or otherwise people will get pissed about the inequality, right? And so the social convention not to talk about money is a, um, it is related to um, social peace. I don't know why I use the quotation marks, right? <laughs> But it is. We don't. We don't want to know how rich the rich people are. Now that we know, it's outrageous. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was never hard to know. We, they also show it. But yeah. somehow, if we want to be friends, we should ignore differences in our, you know, net value. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Otherwise, we'll have to argue over it. Why you have more than I do, and why those people have more than we do, and so, and so we have to pretend that it doesn't really matter. Whereas it matters at every level. As you, that's what your book is about. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, one more question before we close out: uh, If there is a call to action for readers of this book, what would you say it is? Mm. I um I think what this what the research for this book did for me is um it reminded me that our economic system doesn't follow preordained law immutable laws and and actually often um not just lay people like myself but economists will often talk about our own system as if it follows kind of the laws of physics or something, you know, laws that have, are, are not made by people and are not, um, not mutable by people. But the, the reality is that we made this and it's, it, it's made up of lots of little decisions, but it's, it's, the system is made by people. Um, and I think we can lose sight of that, especially because of the terms in which we talk about the, the economic system. and. Uh, the markets kind of having a, a mind or a life of them their own um, but but we are actually in charge and if if we don't my realization in writing this was if we don't like the system and if we don't like what it's doing to us it's it's within our power to change it it's not um, we aren't powerlessly caught up in it so I guess I, I'm not sure that there's a call to action, but if there is, it's it's that it's to kind of um, to to cha take charge of the the nature of the system itself. To uh, we could demand a new set of policies, fiscal policies that would dramatically change the shape of our our economic system. That it, it's totally within our power to reduce inequality, for instance. And historically, we already did it. It's already been done. It's, we had these policies after uh, World War II. It's, and equality in this country shrank way down. And then in the Reagan era, we just reversed all of that. And so um, not only can we do this, we've done it before. So we could, again, do the things that worked the last time and maybe some things that we've never tried, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Agreed. Thank you both so much for joining us. It was such a treat. Um, congratulations again, Eula, on your publication. Alexander, thank you for joining us. Uh, both of these authors' books are available at Green Apple Books. Uh, you can go on our website or come visit us in the store. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. It was really special, and we'll see you next time. Thanks so thank much. You. Thank you.